Hello?
About 54% of Liberians live on less than $2 a day. My entire philosophy on doing business is to empower people, to provide opportunities for people to earn money. I am from Rwanda. My whole skin would just come off easily. I thought I was about to die. I'm turning 18, right? Perfect time to die, but I didn't die. <laughs> I want to start my project before someone else gets the idea. A central hub that works online, because we were the first to do so. Everywhere in the world, entrepreneurs are the same. They have a hope, they have a dreams, they're never afraid of something they want to create. Entrepreneurs, I think we should make them the heroes. Welcome to Africa's Business Hero Show. Last the century, the bigger the better. This century business, the smaller the better. I want any people that are in Africa or anywhere else in the world to believe that they can make money thanks to African culture. Our goal is to go after 10 million farmers in Africa and we get Africa to feed ourselves and the world. Small is nothing wrong. And I live for the day that every African child can access water in their homes. Each one of you give me one advice that I will mark it by heart and I will remember it for 10 years. They can start their dream. They can start their journey. They can the continent. This is the first time we have this program and we will continue to do it. This is how I want to do it. This is my own passion. Over to you, Gordon. Thank you, Evan. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Well, good afternoon, everyone. If you're on GMT time, um, my name is Gordon Adomja from Ashesi University. Welcome to the Africa's Business Heroes webinar series. Uh, today's topic is customer acquisition in the digital era, economic era. 
Um, as you might know, the 2020 Africa's Business Heroes Prize competition has opened, and this year in French as well, as well as English. And it will award a pool of $1.5 million in grant money to 10 finalists. It's open to entrepreneurs across all sectors and all 54 African countries uh, with a special focus on building up their local economies and working to solve the most pressing problems. So we're glad that you're here to talk about some of the key concepts that we want Africa's, Africa's entrepreneurs uh, to be focused on as they build their businesses uh, for success, especially in this COVID era. Today, we have three amazing people uh, led by David Hatchville. Um, David Hatchville is a co-founder and CTO of Bloom Impact, uh, also an adjunct lecturer at the Shetty University. Uh, David is an entrepreneur, a design thinker, a software developer. He's passionate about designing and building technologies that are involved, uh, that, inform, that are informed by nuanced understanding of the socioeconomic and cultural context of the problem. With more than 15 years experience in design and software development, he has created award-winning innovative platforms that bring about social and economic change in areas of finance, agriculture, and health. And he will be joined by Jamila Abdullahi and Akwene Hoga, uh, both of whom he will introduce much later on. So uh, without much ado, I'm gonna turn it over to David Hutchville. Take it away, David. David, we can't hear you. It's, it's always a good idea to go off mute. Uh, good afternoon, I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, Gordon, thank you for the introduction and again, the opportunity to share a little bit about, um, about customer acquisition strategy and how to go about it, particularly in these times uh, where digital uh, has become more important. Um, as Gordon mentioned, I'll have two people helping me today to kind of explore uh, what it means to uh, do cus uh, customer acquisition during these uh, sort of uh, times. Uh, the first is Jamila Abdullahi. Uh, Jamila is a creative director and editor of a multiple award-winning secondspect.com. You should check it out. Uh, it's a digital platform and company that's dedicated to meaningful insights, interaction, and creative action uh, related to Africa and Africans. Uh, Jamila is an economist by training and a self-proclaimed wordsmith. Uh, she has been writing since the age of 10 and uses digital technologies to explore the nuances and interactions between African culture, policy, philosophy, and uh, internet, uh, interest in human interest issues. Sorry. Um, Apena Hoga is the second person. Uh, she's an entrepreneur as well. Uh, she's a content producer and social activist who believes in fostering innovation and economic empowerment among women and youth of Africa. Uh, she's a creative consultant at Sundiata Studios and also co-founder and CEO at Creatives Anonymous Ghana. Her expertise is in fashion and creative arts industry, uh, as an inter and also she's been an international model uh, for over seven years, as well as having an IT background, um, and as well as having an IT background. Uh, she's uniquely positioned uh, in her field. Uh, she's been featured in Vogue Thailand, Refining 29 UK, Daily Mail UK, Glitz Africa, and Joy Magazine, Daily Graphic, My Joy Online, Ghana Web, and many more other sites. Um, and so today what you have is a great panel of people with very deep experience about uh, doing customer acquisition, acquisition uh, in the digital space. Great. So now that that's done, uh, what I'm gonna do for today is start with uh, an overview of the principles of customer acquisition in general. So this is whether it's in the digital space or it's, uh, it's offline. And then what I'm going to do is invite Jamila and uh, Apena to kind of share their unique perspective of how this applies in the digital era. And they'll both take uh, different uh, sort of views on that and I'll explain what the difference is uh, when we get to that point. Uh, so Gordon, if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of take over from you now um, and start sharing. Yeah, please do. All right. All right. So good. So today our topic is going to be on customer acquisition and particularly for startups or people who are starting their business uh, uh, afresh. Um, let's jump kind of right into it. What is customer acquisition? 
uh, you know, a kind of basic general uh, definition people use is, is this one. Uh, it's a process you use to bring in and nurture new customers uh, to your business. Um, I would like to unpack this a little bit. First, it's a process. What this means is that customer acquisition is not a one-time action or one-time event. It's something that you actually do during the full life term of your business. Um, and what this also implies is that it needs to be sustainable. It needs to be something that you can keep doing. Um, it also needs to be adaptable. So for example, um, today we have businesses that uh, for the longest time, because they were situated in a mall or because they were situated in a marketplace, kind of uh, dependent on the fact that people were going to come to these areas to get customers. Um, now with the lockdown that's being faced, uh, being faced by a lot of different uh, countries, this method doesn't work anymore. You're not allowed to be outside. And so you cannot count on people just showing up and you being able to make a sale to them. What this means is that you need to be able to adapt that process. Uh, one second. Uh, secondly, and this may sound a bit obvious, but it's all about bringing people in. Um, now, bringing people in is actually involves a lot of different stages. It's not a light switch where they are out of your business and, and you know, one day and then you flip a switch and then they are in your business. They, are, they, they become your customer. It's actually a set of different stages that uh, you have to go through to make somebody your customer. Um, and, and during today's session, we'll explore what those, uh, uh, those stages are. Um, and then the last key point is, it's about nurturing people to become your customers. Um, we want somebody to hear about you and then them giving you money or paying you for your product or service be quite long, which means in between that period, you need to have a way uh, of, of keeping their interest and maintaining their interest. And so this is what customer acquisition is all about. One, it's a process, so it's ongoing. Two, it's about bringing people in, and we'll go through the different stages it takes to bring people in. Um, and it's about nurturing them. Not everybody's ready when you meet them to buy your product, right? And so you have to figure out a way to keep them engaged um, until they become a customer. And uh, for purposes of definition, uh, a customer is somebody who has paid you for your product or your service, right? Somebody who just knows about you or somebody who's looked at your website is not a customer. Um, and I'll explain later why. Right. So normally I get asked the question, when do you start customer acquisition? Um, uh, it's, it's a pretty good question because generally you can start looking for customers, uh, you know, right away. But basically you start looking or doing customer acquisition once you have a product. For those of you who are familiar with Steve's Blank, uh, different sort of stages of a company, you know, there's a stage where you've identified a problem. Uh, you come up with a solution for the problem. You keep testing. Uh, to see if this problem works. That's what we call customer validation. And once that you've realized that it works and that you're ready for market, um, then you start, you go through this phase that we call customer creation. And there, there are actually a couple of sub steps as well, right? You have to kind of get ready. You have to decide what kind of market you're going after. You have to position your company in terms of PR. Uh, you have to actually launch the product. Um, and then you have to create demand. Now, when you get to that stage of creating demand, that's when you have to start thinking seriously about customer acquisition. Um, now, it's really important uh, to note that these steps that come before creating demand are really important. Because at the end of the day, if you do sell or somebody comes and buys a product or a service from you and it's not quality, it's not solving a problem, then all your efforts at customer acquisition will be for naught. Um, so it's very important that you get those steps right. Um, otherwise, your customer acquisition process uh, will not yield you the type of results you're looking for. So now let's go over some of the general principles of what it takes to do uh, customer acquisition. The first thing to keep in mind is that the customer is at the center of everything you do during this process. And so really understanding how they think and how they act is key to having a successful customer acquisition uh, 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 process. Um, a lot of researchers have looked at how people buy things and, and what kind of decision um, process they go through. And they've been able to kind of narrow it down into these few kind of stages. Now, if I asked you to step back and look at the last few uh, purchases that you made, 
you realize that you did undergo some of these uh, thought processes yourself. Um, and what it, it, it is is that before we all buy something, there are a couple questions that we ask ourselves. Now, sometimes we've gotten so good at this that we don't even realize we are asking ourselves these questions, but we do ask them. And when you're thinking about a customer acquisition process, it's very key to understand what questions your users or your potential customers are asking themselves at each stage. Um, so for example, in the first stage, uh, you know, the, the, uh, let me just use this example. So in Ghana, um, the president has just strongly recommended that people wear masks when they go out because of the uh, COVID-19. Now, what that meant for me was I started thinking, okay, now I need to get a mask. Um, you know, who can help me? Who can get me a mask? Who makes masks? Uh, am I going to get a surgical mask? Am I going to get one of the fancy trendy ones, right? So I start this process. So I start to look uh, around to see who can sell me the mask, right? So that's basically becoming aware of the problem, understanding it, and then beginning to look for options or solutions. Um, and then as I find people who can produce masks, I start to ask questions or ask myself, okay, what do they do? Um, are they creating it at a high enough quality? Uh, are they a good company? Right, I start asking that question. And then I start moving to the next step where I'm interested now. So I may contact a couple of them and say, okay, what's different about you, right? That's the question I'm asking myself. Why should I buy your mask as opposed to this? Now, then I narrow it down a bit more and go, okay, uh, I see to like these two. Which one of them has best value for me? And value could mean money. Value could mean, you know, uh, speaking to some sort of uh, non-tangible value, like, you know, fashion or something like that, right? But which one of it is best value for me? And then once I narrow that down, I go forward and make the purchase. So as you can see, the person who is going to come buy your product, the potential customer, actually goes through a series of steps to be able to decide what it is that they're going to buy and to actually make that purchase, to actually become a customer. And this is what the customer acquisition process is all about. It's about being able to answer the customer's question at each point uh, of, this, uh, of these stages. So now the experts who've kind of studied this have created what they call the sales funnel. And, what that, uh, and that's sort of the technical term they use to describe the process that somebody is going through as they think about making a purchase. And what they've also done is provided some technical terms to describe the customer at each, uh, at each level of, that, of this funnel. Um, and so again, you start with awareness, you know, somebody is aware of a problem. I, I, don't, I need a mask, I need to get a mask, right? Um, and then I'm issue sure some interest because I start Googling around, I start searching your websites, things like that, right? At that point, I'm a lead. Uh, a lead is just somebody who's in your target market, who doesn't know about you, but is interested in a problem that you're trying to solve, right? And so you're a lead for them. Now, the moment I contact you because I want to learn more about what you're producing, what you're given, that's when I become a prospect. I'm a, and I'm a prospect because I haven't bought anything from you. I'm just kind of gone to the next step as a customer or a potential customer of expressing interest, right? Um, and then eventually I, I become a customer. I, I buy that thing because you've convinced me that it's what I need and it solves the problem that I have. Um, and uh, if you look at the, at the diagram that's uh, to the right, uh, that multicolored one, you realize that there's a last step where actually as part of the process, you can turn your customer into a fan. You can turn them into an advocate, somebody who goes out there and begins to tell people about you. Um, and later on, I'll explain how that can help you become more efficient uh, with your customer acquisition uh, process. Um, so again, uh, the, these are kind of technical terms to help you understand stage that your, your customer is in or your potential customer is in as they move from somebody who doesn't know about you to somebody who's ready to purchase your, uh, your product. Um, and again, it's important that you know these questions that they are asking because part of your customer acquisition process is being able to answer for whatever type of business you're running, being able to answer those questions correctly for them so that they go to the next uh, level. Um, if it's not clear already, um, the reason it's called a funnel is because uh, the number of people who may be, for example, aware that they need a mask will not be the same number of people who eventually end up buying a mask from you, right? As people move through each stage, uh, they become fewer and fewer, and that's why it's, it's called a funnel. You end up with this look. So you may have 500,000 people who say, hey, I need a mask, uh, but only 80 people who end up buying the mask, right? 
Um, and, and again, this is what customer acquisition is about. It's about how you nurture the relationship for the, uh, you know, the people who come in and know that they have uh, a need and then working with them to answering their questions and getting them to a point where they actually make a purchase uh, from you. Um, what I'm going to do now is kind of go through two examples to kind of see, uh, show you how this works. And then after that, we'll actually get into the nitty gritty of how you do this in a kind of a digital uh, world. So again, the typical acquisition life cycle is this. You drive traffic you know, to your product. Somehow you do social media ads, you do uh, advertisements on TVs, you call people up. There are a lot of different ways in which you can drive traffic to your product. And then you have to convert them, right? People hear about you, but somehow you have to get them interested in what uh, it is that you're providing. And then you have to nurture them. We've talked about that. If they are not ready to buy, how do you keep them interested? Um, and then it's time to uh, make a sale. You also have to make that as smooth as possible. So for the first example, imagine that you're a financial planner and that you have a product that can help people kind of plan their lives, their financial lives well, and to be successful financially. And you want to sell this to millennials. Now kind of thinking through what we've just gone, uh, let, we'll just apply kind of the funnel uh, analogy to this. So the first thing you want to do is probably raise awareness to the fact that you know, people need financial planning, they need to plan their lives. And you, know, you may do that through social media ads because you're targeting uh, millennial clients. Again, understanding your customer and knowing where to reach them, right? Um, and so you may do that through social media ads, uh, using Facebook or Instagram, any of those uh, that are uh, available. Now you've attracted them, right? So maybe I see the ad on Instagram, I click on it. Um, now you have to educate them, right? You have to let them know who you are, what you're about, because they need to know that to be able to begin that trust, to be able to begin to know whether you can really solve your problem, right? Or in some cases, to even know whether they are the ones you are targeting in terms of are they the ones experiencing uh, this problem. Um, and so you may do that through some blog posts. So I click on the ad, it takes me to your blog, I read a little bit. You know, you may have interesting topics like steps to conquer your student loan, how to become a millionaire in, th in three months, you know, things like that. That would happen. Um, and then you may have a landing page. And, and uh, for those not familiar, a landing page would be a page that may have a box where you can enter in your email address to say, oh, you know, contact me later, send me more information. This is part of the process of converting them to be more interested in your products, right? To be able to be know more about you. Um, and so say the person enters in their email address on your landing page, um, you know, now they are your customer, but, uh, well, they're not your customer, but they are a prospect. You only have their email address. And until they are ready to either download your app or buy your book, whatever it is that you're selling, you have to keep them engaged. So maybe one way you do that is you keep sending them emails, right? Uh, and maybe on the landing page, you also take their phone number. So you may contact them via WhatsApp or via other channels. But the idea is that you're engaging them, you're sending them content that's relevant to them. So that at the point where they decide that, man, I have a lot of money, I need to you know, make sure I'm managing it well, or I'm broke, I need to make sure that I'm managing uh, my finances well, you are top of mind, right? Because you've been engaging with them. And then at that point, they may go in and you may you make sure you have an offer for them in either, each of your emails or however how you're reading out, reaching out to them so that they can click on that and then they can you know, either purchase your book or purchase the app or whatever it is you need them to do uh, in terms of using your service, right? And so again, this is an example that takes somebody from the top of making them aware of your product down to the process of, uh, of them actually making a purchase. So going back to the definition, this is the bringing in phase, right? So you've, you've, uh, it, it's a process, but you have to bring them in. And the bringing them in involves a lot of different steps. And you have to make sure that you're following these steps. Um, I'm going to go through a second example just to help uh, clarify things. Uh, so uh, Bloom Impact is the company I run. It's an online marketplace that helps small businesses get access to financial services. So if you want a loan, you want a savings account, you can download our app and you can apply uh, to it. Now, the way in which we drive uh, traffic to Bloom Impact, uh, you can see here that 25% of them actually come from people who use that product and really like it, right? So we have some fans, some advocates who are going out and bringing people into the platform. And this is great because uh, that means that I don't have to spend time making people aware. I don't have to spend resources making people aware. Um, and also, they, uh, because the re referral is coming from somebody they know, 
the, tr the trust that you know the person has in their friend is transferred from impact as well, right? Uh, so that being able to get people is really critical, passing down the cost of, of customer acquisition. Um, but 75% comes from, you know, no more sort of above the line and below the activity. Social media, in meeting a small, uh, uh, small scale industry groups, using the products to them and all that. So we do all of that to be able to attract uh, people. Now, one thing I want to point out here is that it's very, very important to make sure that whatever you're doing with your customer acquisition process, you are tracking it in terms of numbers. You always have KPI indicates you have the acquisition process is being successful or not. Uh, we do that at Bloom. That's why we know that 25% of our from referral programs and 75 are three. Um, and that's also to change and modify your process to make sure you're putting resources in the right place. Um, and later on, if you have questions, you can send them to how to start to measure and how to track uh, different activities. So that's how we drive traffic at Bloom Impact. Now, say we've, we, you know, we are successful, people have become aware, they've downloaded the app. Now we need to convert them, right? They've downloaded the app, but we don't know anything about them. Oh, you know, we can tell that you know, 500 people have downloaded the app, right? But we don't know who they are. And it is this conversion process that helps us to know who they are. Um, and so the first thing we do is we anticipate the questions that they may have. Um, and based on the questions that they have, they are able to answer them. Uh, we answer it from them here, so you can see how it works, digital profile, safe and secure. Once they are done answering those questions, uh, they, you know, they can then move on to signing up. And with the sign up, really easy, right? It's just a couple of fields that you fill out to sign up for the app. And then again, very important, we ask, how did you hear about us? Now, this is, again, collecting data that informs uh, 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 customer acquisition process. Because when we know where people are hearing about us, where they're coming from, we know where to put more resources or where we know we have to tweak things, right? So as much as possible, try and collect data that will help you uh, improve your process. Now, you know, people may download the app, but they may not be ready to apply for a loan, right? And so we have to somehow keep them engaged. So the way we do that, two ways, we keep sending them notification and messages with relevant, important uh, information uh, that would, you know, pique their interest. Um, and then secondly, we have tools on the app. So for, uh, we have what we call my allows you to do simple inventory of your store. And this keeps them engaged, right? They keep coming back to the app. They're keeping track of the things that buy schools and expenses. Um, but it's engaging them to the point that when they actually need a loan, they remember that Bloom Impact can do that for them and they can come through uh, and, and apply. And when somebody is ready to purchase, again, you have to be kind of ready to help them. You have to make it really simple for them to make that purchase, whether it's, uh, you know, purchasing options, uh, whether it's availability of, of pickup, all of that. You have to really think about how you make it easy for somebody to make that purchase. That's part of the customer acquisition process, right? Um, so, for example, if you do have an online e-commerce store, somebody comes to you, uh, you notice that, you know, they've put a lot of things in their carts, but they've not purchased it yet. You may want to reach out and try and find out, okay, what's the issue? Are you having a challenge, you know, doing going through the sales process? Uh, because until they buy, they are not your customer, right? And so as much as possible, you want to make that process smooth and you want to be able to aid them. Uh, so what what we do for Bloom Impact, for example, if somebody started an application and has left and left it for a couple of days, we send them a reminder to continue. We send them a reminder to, uh, to try and find out if there's anything wrong, right? And then the last important point is about trying to make people your fans, right? So on our app, we make it very easy for people to recommend us. You can share about Bloom Impact uh, to your, uh, to their, uh, their customers can share it to their, to their friends, uh, to other businesses that may be interested in it. And this makes it easy for somebody to become an advocate uh, for, for our company. Good. All right. So what we've kind of covered right now are sort of the basic principles of what, you know, customer acquisition is. It's a process. It's about bringing people in and there are stages to how people are brought in. And this is tied to how people purchase things, right? The process they go through uh, to purchase things. Um, and what once you get them sort of into that funnel, you have to nurture them until the point that they, uh, they make a purchase. And we have gone through a couple of examples of that. 
Now I want us to get a little bit more specific about how you would do that in the digital world. And I'm going to have uh, Jamila and, um, and, and Apena come in to help us with this. So first is uh, Jamila. And, uh, and what she's going to do is talk about the, the concept of having a customer acquisition strategy, right? And that's what this comic is about. Aware that so many online channels change people, right? But sometimes we do not come up with a plan for they actually are. We are going to use those channels, and so we kind of just jump on there. Uh, but what we are hoping, what you need to develop is a strategy, and Jimmy is going to talk a little bit about that, and then Apena will speak a little bit about the actual tactics that you use to be able to do this. Thank you. All right, so Jamila, you can you can go ahead. Okay, thank you, David, and hi, everyone. Uh, I think David definitely gave a very good grounded introduction, so you have a lot of the key elements already. Uh, what I'm going to do now is going to, I'm breaking it up into two areas. First, going digital, how to come up with your strategy, the five questions that you need to consider. And then secondly, we'll talk about some principles for navigating the digital space so that you can move your customers along that funnel from just being interested persons to being your brand ambassadors. So first of all, how do you go digital? What are the five questions you need to consider? The first one you need to think about is what are you doing online or specifically why are you going online you need to understand what your motivations are for taking your business online granted for many of us it will probably be just because everybody is going online but you need to get a bit more specific for your business so for instance if you are going online to scope potential new customers or clients you might have totally different goals or a totally different strategy from someone who is going online just to sell, right? And is not really looking to have a sense of who else is in the market. So that's the first thing you need to figure out. Second thing you need to figure out is what are you selling? You probably already know what your product is, but the more important question here is, how is it different from the other players in the market? Because that value proposition is really what is going to determine whether customers come to your digital platforms to purchase from you or they decide to go elsewhere. And so it's very important to narrow down exactly what you're selling. And sometimes we tend to think that we're selling a physical product, but if you do some of the things that David mentioned to try and get a sense of who your customers are, what they actually want or are interested in, you might find out that what you're actually selling is not a product, but instead it might be the way your customers feel from using your product. So for, for example, one of my clients, um, it's called Kaime, and they produce shea butter in Ghana and ship um, all over the world. And I mean, shea butter products are abound in Ghana. So why would a customer pick Kaime over another shea butter product, for example? And um, we did some work together to get a sense of why customers pick Kaime, and it's because of how Kaime makes them feel. So when I say think about what you're selling, it might not be the first level thing with it, which is the physical product or the service. It might be something else that people are actually coming to you for. Number three is where should you be online? There are hundreds of social media platforms. Granted, we know the main ones, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok is, is making waves these days, but there are hundreds of other platforms. So you really need to take the time to narrow down which platforms will work for your business. Just to give a quick overview on what each of the main platforms typically offers, Twitter is great for global conversation. So if you're looking to take your product global, maybe you've been in the market for a while, um, you've, you've seen some successes and you're looking to scale up, you wanna start having those global com conversations to get a sense of who else might be interested in your product. And Twitter is a great place to do that, plug into those conversations. Facebook is all about connections and community. But as a business, what it really gives you the opportunity to do is to understand your audience a bit more. The analytics and insights on Facebook are very, very in-depth and give you a sense of who actually is coming for your product or service and if they're actually the people you were targeting in the first place. YouTube 
is all about experiences. So if you have a product or service that is rooted in experience, this is where you definitely want to be. You want to show how that product or service can be of value and not just tell about it like you might do on a blog, for example. And then Snapchat and TikTok are all about creativity. So if you're targeting um, young people, millennials who are very new age and like to be very engaged, love challenges, those are two platforms that you want to explore. Instagram is about finding a tribe. Granted, we know that there are a lot of travel junkies on Instagram. We know that there are a lot of beauty people on Instagram and so on, basic, basically creatives. But if you pay attention to the interactions on Instagram, people tend to gravitate towards a tribe. So if you're looking to build community, Instagram is a great place for doing that. Now, these platforms are what you call non-native platforms, meaning you do not own it. And um, if you check the terms very closely, it's likely that some of these companies actually own or have access to your content. So you also want to invest in a native platform or a blog, website or blog. The reason for that is number one, you have more control over the platform. So you don't have to worry too much if Twitter, um, let's say there's a Twitter, Twitter blackout or Instagram has a blackout because too many people are using it and it crashes. Your native platform or blog, you typically have some control over. And so that way, people can still find you even if any of these other platforms I mentioned end up going out of business. Who knows? Okay, number four, when should you be online? So there's a process to going online. And I'll talk a bit more about um, how you decide what you should do online. But beyond the overall, is my business ready to go online yet? The other thing you need to pay attention to is when are your customers online? Because if you're putting out content and your target customers are asleep, it means that because of the amount of content that is online, they might miss it. Unless, of course, you've already successfully moved them down that funnel and they are fans or diehard brand ambassadors who will come onto your page directly to see what you're doing. Number five is how should you engage digitally and the how really all of these other questions that uh, I've presented will feed into your how but generally speaking and taking the current context of COVID into consideration if you have zero to minimal presence online you really want to invest in learning about digital you want to invest in building your digital skills and also building the skills and uh, the capacity of your team when it comes to digital um, if you have some presence online already and some elements of a strategy, you want to focus on providing valuable content. Content that, as David said, will keep people coming back even if they are not going to purchase from you yet. And this is actually what um, my company Circumspect um, and website circumspect.com have done over over the course of over 10 years, we provide valuable content that keeps people coming back. And then when we do offer a service or when we do offer an event or want to sell something, they are already there and we're no longer looking for the customer. So the, the question about content is very important. You also want to test and experiment to fine tune your strategy. If you already have some content, this is the time to look at your analytics and see what works and what doesn't and fine tune accordingly. I think David also mentioned the importance of measuring, so that's it. Ultimately, with some presence, you want to move towards engaging so that you build your audience and grow your audience further. Now, the final level is if you have a good digital strategy that is already working for you, but you're trying to figure out how can we um, convert more of our followers, for example, to be paying customers, you need to give value and nurture your community. And what that means is you need to make sure that you're responding to comments. You need to make sure that you are asking them questions to get information that you otherwise would not get because you already have that audience. Um, so now I'm going to talk about key principles for navigating the digital space. And all of this feeds into how you should engage digitally, and depending on where you are in that um, strategy uh, uh, formulation process, what you should be doing. The first principle is that content is key. You can come online and decide to buy followers, but that is non-organic growth. And so what it means is that at some point, those people are going to fall off. 
if you really want to ensure that you have sustainable growth online, you need to focus on building content that is useful to the audiences that you're trying to target. So focus your content not on anything and everything, but be very focused. If you are, um, for instance, you offer financial services like, like David's company does, the kind of content you want to put out should be linked to what industry you're in. So you could be talking about how to do accounting, personal finance, um, what tools and strategies coming as you're coming um, into the, the business sphere. That's the kind of content you want to put out. Content should either be useful, inspiring, humorous, educative, whatever the case, you need to figure out for you what kind of content you want to create. And at the end of the day, it's all about digital storytelling. Stories are what make the digital sphere go round. Number two, give value first before you ask for a sale. So a lot of people, especially on Instagram, will uh, post the photo. They've just come on Instagram, just created a platform. And the first thing they're doing is they're selling a product. But you have not yet built any trust with the people who are coming onto your page. And so the likelihood of them giving you your money is very, very low. So you need to first focus on giving value and do it multiple times over before you ask for the sale. So it's about building trust first before asking for something in return. Now, in the context of Africa, because there's already a lot of content on, on the web, the, the main way that you can do it and stand out and really add value is to think contextually. So think about creating local content Think about context-specific content, so not just co creating content for entrepreneurs, for example. It should be for African entrepreneurs or Namibian entrepreneurs or Ghanaian entrepreneurs or Lagos-based entrepreneurs. So try to get very, very specific. And then also be customer-centric. So in as much as you might have your ideas about what your customers or audience might need, the reality is sometimes you might be totally off the mark. So one thing we do at Circumspect is from time to time, we ask our audience questions like, what kind of content do you want now? Um, is there something you would like to see on the website? Or whenever we do our trainings, for example, and we have them fill an evaluation form, we ask them, what else would you like to be trained on? If it's something that we already have, then it means that when we have an upcoming session, we can tell them about it. But it's something we don't yet have, then we keep it in mind for when we're building um, new training services. So that is very important. Give value first before asking for the sale. Number three, I kind of touched on it already, so I'm just going to mention, I'm not going into it, grow organically. There's value to growing organically and even more so now. If you pay attention to many of the social media platforms, they're moving away from what they call vanity metrics, meaning it's not so much about how many followers you have, it's more about how are you engaging with the followers that you do have, no matter how small they may be. So you need to really move from trying to grow your audience, of course, after a certain point, to engaging with that audience and then converting them into customers. Number four, think visual. So for the longest time, much of the web was very text-based, but today we have a lot of options by way of video, photo, text, Okay, I mentioned text and then audio. And video generally gets more engagement than photos, which gets more engagement than text. So what you want to do is have a good mix of different content types that you offer and always try to think visually. Even if you're talking about something as boring as, think about whatever is the most boring topic you know. You will want to think about how can I bring this to life in the mind of my customer, if it's like a, a, in written form, for example. Number five, Test, measure, and improve. You're already online. If you're already online, take time periodically to review your analytics. I think David talked about that, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. Number six is social listening. And what that means is you listen to what your customers say. You, and that could be either passively, just paying attention to the kind of comments on your page or on competitor pages or just on the web with, with regards to things that are linked to your business or you create a feedback loop whereby your customers and your potential um, and your audience can give you that feedback directly. And then the final point I wanted to make on principles for navigating the digital space, 
is to think about online and offline linkages. Because at the end of the day, for the majority of our African countries, a big chunk of us are not yet online. And that process will happen, but it will take time. So you want to make sure that you provide opportunities to still connect with those customers who are not necessarily online, so that when they do come online, they will try and find you. And part of that is investing in the customer experience. So for example, if you offer delivery services, you want to make sure that not just the web or e-commerce platform process and experience is seamless, but you also want to make sure that the process of receiving whatever product you're delivering to this person is also seamless. Because if there's frustration at either point where you don't actually step in to apologize if it's not necessarily your fault, then you're going to lose, off, lose your, your customers and then um, that's going to affect the whole funnel process. So those are just the elements I thought would be most important for you guys. And I wish you all the best. If you want additional resources, um, do check out circumspect.com. We have a lot of free resources on there. And we also offer digital skills trainings if that's what you're looking for. Thank you, David. I think I'm done. Thank you very much, uh, Jamila, for uh, walking us through that. Uh, now I'll very quickly uh, invite uh, Penet to kind of share from her perspective uh, what it means to do customer acquisition uh, digitally. Um, and I'll encourage you, if you have any questions, uh, please put those in the Q&A uh, chat uh, box. Uh, somebody will, uh, will pick those questions up, and uh, at the end of the session, we will address uh, those, uh, those questions. Uh, so Penet, you can, you can take over now. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you, Jamila, for setting the, um, the stage uh, before I come. Uh, I just want to, um, basically what I'm coming to talk about is the icing on the cake that um, David has probably baked and Jamila has baked. And these are used in any acquisition process. Um, and basically, these are going to be ways you can utilize some of the strategies, the principles that have been shared by Jamila as well. So I'm just going to go through a few of them. Um, and, you know, I think we, we, we mentioned throughout this whole presentation of this whole webinar, the importance of having an online presence, but it's not, it's not enough to create an account if, you know, the account is not created well. Um, and that just goes on to say that one thing you need to really think about when you are setting the account is the question Jamila asked, that is, why are you online? Because um, that is going to feed into what you will have on your bio and what you will basically have on your profile. And your profile is what people will look at the first, that's the first thing people look at when they come and visit your um, page, whether it's a website, whether it's a portfolio, whether it's a social media page or not. So that is something you need to really um, take into consideration. And if you're able to answer the five questions that she, Jamila mentioned very, very well, it will be very easy for you to craft um, an online bio or profile that will basically tell your customers everything about you as soon as they get to your social media page. So one of the questions that you can ask is, again, why are you online? Um, and what is different about what you are doing or the products or the services you are offering from what is already available in the market? Um, if you're able to answer these two very well, that, that, will, be, that, that will help you or will fill your bio or your profile. The second tactic I want to mention is the, the art of content creation. Um, we've mentioned, you know, uh, that content is key and that is something that will help customers, um, you know, become aware of your products, get educated on your products or your services, and also help them retain and become ad advocates for your brand. Um, and, you know, creating content, especially in these times, can be very tricky if you're used to going to these uh, traditional ad agencies to create your content for you. Now, we, a lot of um, the, the countries are in lockdown. So you have to focus on other ways of still creating content. And one of them, which has become very popular um, in the, 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 
yeah, the first few months of 2020 is using my micro influences. So as Jamila mentioned, we are moving away from the traditional big accounts, um, using big accounts to either advertise your services or your products. People are now looking for accounts that are engaging and that's what micro influencers do. Basically they have less than 10,000 followers, but you can tell from their comments and the, the amount of times that their contents are being shared that a lot of people are engaging on their, co like on their page. So um, when you are creating content, these are people you can look at. You just send them the product or you tell them about the services or give them some service and then they will create content around that for you. So you don't have to even pay for the the production of the content um, and then the advertising of it. Um, it's all joined in one. Yeah, it's all, um, it's all combined in one, which is what the macro or micro influencers would do, specifically micro influencers if you are trying to grow engagement. Um, also on the, the point of creating content, also on the point of creating content, um, it is important to note that apart from, you know, using micro influencers, there are contents that you can also create, create on your phone if you're on a budget specifically. Um, and some of these um, tools, which I use myself and for, for posting on my, my different platforms, one of them is Canva. Canva helps you basically create posters, create PDFs, create Facebook posts, Facebook ads, anything you're looking for has a template on Canva that you can use. So you don't have to hire a graphic designer if you don't have the resources to hire a graphic designer. Um, Canva is basically the one-stop shop that aids you in creating content for your social media page. Also on content, um, it's important to create content, but it's also very important to Again, like Jamila mentioned, know when your audience are online and capitalize on that time that they spend online. And one of the tools that I specifically use is a, an app called Later, Later as in L-A-T-E-R, Later. And this helps you schedule your posts. So you can schedule your posts if you sit and you create um, content for a whole month, you can schedule them and then basically put your captions in there, schedule it with the time and whatever hashtags you want. And then when the time comes, this will automatically post your um, content for you. So it reduces the time that you spend creating content and also the time that you spend um, putting that content out because posting it actually takes a lot of work, finding the right captions, you know, making sure that people you're posting at the right time, it can get uh, mixed up with, all the other operations that you, you do in your business. So it's great to schedule them and then it, it goes out. One tool, again, now I want to mention in terms of content creation is using your, your phone, your phone to take pictures, your phone to take videos and getting apps like Lightroom, like Facetune um, to help you edit those pictures. Um, another app you can use for editing your videos is called Quick. It's Q U I K. Um, it's there. There are other ones as well. In story, we have um, iMovie. We have we have different ones. Um, and it's important to find low cost ways of still producing content whilst you are home or like you know um, staying safe, basically. Um, and I apart from content creation, it's important to grow organically and build content or build value for the people who are following you. And um, in the last few months, we've seen a surge in Instagram live videos because companies, uh, whether small brands or not, have realized how important it is to keep close, to, to have a personal relationship with their, their customers, basically. And that's what Instagram live does. It gives you the opportunity to connect with the followers that you already have um, using the same platform. So there are different ways to go about it. There are different ways to engage the customers still. And apart from Instagram Live, you can, before you start doing an Instagram Live, you can 
try it out with your stories. Instagram stories are basically 24 hour, um, 24 hour stories that are at the top of your Instagram page. So you usually see like a round, um, a round image of the person's profile. And if you tap on that at the top of the, the app, you start seeing the stories they post and that will disappear in 24 hours. So if you're looking for um, ideas or content, if you're looking for um, whether or not customers will be interested in an IG live or whatever content you want to create, Instagram story is actually a great way to test that out. So it's basically like your, your playing field and you can do, you can ask questions there. You can um, ask for recommendations. You can do polls and that's all great for, um, it's all great for researching exactly what your customers need. Finally, I'm going to touch on, you know, SEOs. Um, that, that basically is, falls under evaluating um, your content or what you are putting out there. Um, SEOs are basically search engine optimization tools or strategies. And these are basically tags or words you use um, to help people who go and search for your products or your services online to find you easily. So if you have a website, you make sure that it, it, you use some S, like you, you, you use some SEO tools or strategies in there. And that is how when somebody types in a particular um, phrase or particular word, your website will be, will be amongst the first few that will show up. So basically, these are like some tools that you can use. Also, making use of analytics. And that's not only, it's, it doesn't only apply to your website or your app um, or your newsletter or blog. You can track your analytics on your social media platforms as well. Instagram has um, a great analytics tool that you use to check your customers' time online, the number of women and men that follow you. So you track your demographic, you track their timing, you track their activities in every week. So that gives you basically um, in a week, if you are able to create a certain content, you get feedback through your Instagram page or even through your Facebook now, um, you get feedback on how your customers were able to interact with that content how you know how many people were online when they interacted so it gives you the the space to make changes before you go into planning content for another week um again if you want more information on you know creating content now podcasts are also a very like you know important tool important ways of creating content to reach to you know, wider audience, although visuals, you know, visuals are important. Sometimes if you, you already have, you know, the visual setup, you need to start thinking about different ways that you can also reach out to people who, again, might not be um, Instagram savvy or are not into, into visuals. So then you think about audio tools and you can go from there. Um, but if you want more specifically for an African creative entrepreneur, check out creativesanonymousgh.com. We have some free resources. We have a podcast show as well um, that comes out every week that gives basically um, marketing and business tools for starting your brand or building your brand. But I think, yes, um, unless, if you have any other questions, I would, I would um, end here and then maybe address some of the concerns or questions you might have when that time comes for Q&A. Yeah, David. Um, I think I'm 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 through. Thank you very much, Abena, for uh, sharing all of that with us. Um, right. Just to recap, uh, basically, what the uh, Jimmy talking about is the idea to have a strategy and you need to have tactics, right? And they've gone into some detail about, uh, you know, the type of questions you need to ask when you're developing your strategy, and then some specifics about the tactics that you need to employ. Um, as we uh, mentioned, the, um, you can ask questions, specific questions, and some of you have been doing that. 
Um, and so what we'll do now is wrap it up and then start answering some of those questions uh, that you've put up. Uh, but before we go, remember, I love this quote uh, because it tells you the importance uh, of having a strategy and, and also of having tactics, right? So asking why doing things. Uh, strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Uh, tactics without strategy is the noise before the defeat. So you do need both and you need to make sure that uh, for your customer acquisition process, you do have both the strategy and tactics uh, for it. Um, so to sum up, uh, things you should, you know, kind of key points you should take away with you are this. First, it's about the customer, right? The way they think, the way they buy, the way they make purchasing, you need to understand that. You need to understand the questions they are asking so that you can answer them. Um, it's about nurturing, right? Um, once you get people aware of your products, once you have them asking you about questions about it, you need to find a way to keep them engaged uh, so that you can work with them through your funnel until they make a purchase. It's about data. Uh, the three of us spoke about that. You need to be able to measure what is happening, the work you're doing. Is it being effective that, you know, if you, you know, Instagram versus uh, Twitter for what you want to achieve according to your strategy, which one is working? Um, secondly, you need, it's a strategy and also strategy with tactics, right? You need to consider both the long and the short term goals that you have um, and make sure that that is accommodated for within that uh, position's uh, process that you have. And then uh, lastly, it's a process, right? It needs to be sustainable. You shouldn't be spending like, you know, trying to spend 20,000 CDs uh, or dollars or whatever your currency is uh, every month trying to um, run it. You may run yourself out of business, right? So you need to make sure it's sustainable. It's something you can keep doing. As Afena mentioned, you know, posting regularly is a task. It's difficult, it's, it's tedious. So you need to make sure what you're doing will work for you, will make sure that you can focus on your business as well. Um, and it needs to be adaptable. Things like COVID will happen. And you need to be able to be flexible enough to change your strategy uh, to make it work. Um, and so these are sort of the last uh, shooting up points we'll leave this with. And then I'll hand over to, um, uh, to Gordon uh, to help us, uh, you know, kind of handle the, the Q&A section. Uh, some of you have some questions. I've answered those uh, in the chats, but uh, maybe Gordon will pick up a couple that we can answer. Uh, live here to uh, so that everybody can benefit from it. So, okay. uh, Gordon, uh, you want to take it over? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, so maybe we can take a few. One here from uh, David Gou, and it says, "How long should you continue to give value before pushing for sales?" And how do you measure which products are being accepted specifically if you have not yet started selling? Uh, and I think I can piece it together with the next question. Any suggestions on how I can measure the integrity of data acquired? Uh, so maybe we can start with those two, yeah. All right, good. So I think the first question will be, Jamila, uh, how, how long should you continue giving value before uh, pushing for sales? Uh, thank you for the question. That's a good question. Um, I would say that the value process doesn't end. So what you actually want to do is you want to feed it into your overall digital strategy and actually into whatever it is you're doing. Uh, value does not necessarily have to be an enormous thing. It's not saying always do promotions or give discounts. Value can be something as simple as, for example, you have um, COVID happening right now, and it's likely that some of your customers, even if they won't tell you, they want to get your product, but they are afraid because of the current environment. So value is something as simple as sending a message to find out how your customers are doing and letting them know what measures you have put in place to protect them, right? So I would say... I mean, it really depends on your, your uh, product and service and business. But for circumspect, what we tend to do is, so on average, we will publish, let's say, two articles a month on average. And we have a total of two events a year. And those events will usually have a ticket cost to them, requiring um, our customers who are interested to purchase those tickets. So we spread it out. So let's say we would have one event in the first half of the year and the second event in the second half of the year. So you have a good space of about maybe four months. By the time 
let's assume that this is a, a, a customer who wants to attend both events. So they pay for the first one. By the time we start asking them to pay for the next one, that is, they've probably had eight articles with good content that they have been able to use in some way before we ask them for um, to pay for something else. So you do have to keep that in mind. And a lot of it would depend on the profile of your customer. Are they, do they mind spending money online? What do they like to spend their money on? Um, what, are, what is the cost of the services and so on that you're offering? So I don't know if that helps a bit, but think of it more as it's not something that starts and ends. It's something that is should be the bedrock of everything you're doing. And then you plant these um, sale ask points across that cycle. I hope that answers your question. Let me know if you still yeah. have questions. No, yeah, that's good. Um, and uh, if you noticed in my slides, I talked about how uh, Bloom Impact, we have the store feature. That's not uh, you know, core business but it adds value uh, over the lifetime for the client for having that app on their phone if they choose to use it to manage their inventory, right? And so that keeps them engaged until the point that they are ready to make a sale. Um, to the second part of the question, um, how do you measure which products are being accepted, especially if you have not started selling? Um, now, if you remember, and I'll try and go up here, um, uh, I talked about when you start doing uh, customer acquisition. And I mentioned that you typically do it, uh, let me see if I can get there, uh, right. You uh, do it after you have a product or you've kind of launched a product, right? A lot of the processes that go on before is actually you testing the products that you have and seeing that if it solves a problem, if people want it. So it's at that stage that you determine if people are willing to purchase your thing. And normally at this point, you are mostly testing with friends and family a few uh, people that you may know who may be interested in, right? Um, and then once you've, uh, you know, uh, uh, ascertained that they can, you know, this is a, pro a product that fit, uh, uh, fixes the problem and you package it in a way that people want to buy it. So, you know, your friends and everybody are excited about it and they're giving you money uh, to even get it. Then you start thinking about, okay, how do I go to the world? How do I go global with this? That's the point where you start thinking about customer acquisition. And so, um, uh, typically, uh, by the time that you're doing customer acquisition, you already have some sense that the product you're trying to sell has a market uh, for it, right? You have a, what we call a product market fit and people are willing to buy it. And actually the process of cu uh, customer creation, uh, in technical terms, we call it uh, uh, what we call crossing the chasm, right? So the chasm is like a huge gap. Your friends and family are willing to buy this. Now is the rest of the world willing to buy it? And customer uh, creation, customer acquisition is all about kind of bridging that gap from your friends and family who have bought it, your early investors, your early uh, testers, right, to the rest of the world. Uh, so hopefully that answers that. Let's see. Uh, okay, and the question on data integrity. So maybe what I'll do is I'll tell you what I do. I try to always uh, uh, have a what I call a triangulation strategy. So um, I, I use, uh, you know, Google has a lot of different tools for being able to track who downloaded your app. Um, uh, within my app, I track, you know, different things about what people have clicked on, what they spend a lot of time on. But I try to use, you know, you can always collect data, but you have to analyze it. So I try to use at least three different sort of sources of data or three different lenses to look, to try and understand the information I'm seeing to be able to say uh, whether the data I'm getting is, is, is uh, credible, right? So if my downloads are telling me something very different from how people are using it and all of that, then I may have, a I have to question the source of data and go back and, and make sure it's, it's right. Um, and so I, I guess when it comes to data, one thing is you don't want to be only looking at one source because that will only tell you a slice of the story. You want to try and get as many uh, sources of data about your acquisition process. So you may even have things around customers giving you feedback, right? A contact us form, all of that stuff. You bring all of those together to be able to get a fuller picture on how the process is going so that you can know that you are acting on, uh, on valid and viable information. Um, there's a question here that I, I'll give to either Apena or to, um, uh, or to Jemima. I think it's an interesting one. Uh, what do you do in the case where your other client is a business? So in a B2B environment, as opposed to a, um, a B2C uh, uh, environment. And this question is from Evans or so. Um, you know, I think 
most of the, the strategies and the plans or the tactics that we've mentioned here today apply to either um, customers in terms or, or even businesses. Um, for instance, if your, your clients are businesses, you still need to ask what you're offering that is so different from what they, they already don't have. And some of these businesses, as you're also looking to go online, these businesses also have um, basically an online presence. So one way you can also do this, basically these same strategies and tactics work, is just that you have to be a bit more, um, you, you need to understand why they are also online. You need to also go through some of their comments that they have with their customers to get an idea of what their values are because majority of the time, that is where you you get to hear the voice. <laughs> it's funny, but you get to hear the voice of the company through their interactions online. Um, and you just have to, basically use the same tools and scout them online and try and do your research about how they also operate online. That will give you a fair idea of what profile they have because for customers, it's very easy to draw up a profile and say, okay, this person is, um, it's, it's like this, thinks like this and acts like this. For businesses, um, and if you're lucky enough to have them online, then these are also things that they, they are still, uh, doing with their customers so it gives you basically it gives you um, a little bit of a window into how they also operate what are their values and um, what things they take seriously and how they also sound like online um, with their customers so i would say that basically the same strategies and um, tactics will, will work um, you just have to might just be a few things you have to adjust to um, get them to be effective or efficient when dealing with your business clients. Um, also, I want to, you know, quickly touch on the first question and the second part of the first question, which is how do you select some of the things that um, basically, how do you, how do you select what to sell if you haven't started selling? Um, and from my personal experience with Creatives Anonymous, we just started creating contents that are based on our questions, on, on our stories. And I mentioned how stories are very important in gathering information. If you have Twitter, you can involve yourself in Twitter polls and ask questions and let people choose. Um, if you have stories, you can conduct polls on there. You can ask questions. But also, some of the content that you will be putting out, um, let it be strategic to some of the things you want to uh, sell. So for instance, you have um, uh, a digital product or a digital workshop that talks about how to build your website. You can do like a, an Instagram post that basically just talks about a few of the things or how people can do it or some of the tools they can use. If you put it out there, you can, be, you, you can track how many people have shared it, how many people have um, sent it to somebody else, the likes, the comments, so basically in your process of creating value, you can still track some of the things that people um, gravitate more towards or the people who you are trying to attract online gravitate towards. And that will basically feed back into you creating a, a product that will end up catching on to that particular um, target group. All right, thank you. Um, there's a question here from Erica Champong and he asked, uh, would you advise a startup to design their own strategy or outsource it because uh, listening to the experts, it appears that the best option is to get an expert, but the experts are not affordable for a startup. Uh, that's a good question. Um, you always have to kind of weigh, um, you know, uh, the, the value of what you're doing with the cost for the rest of your business. And this is how uh, at least I have a, a approached that. Um, I always feel, especially as a startup, that it's key that you understand the processes uh, that you are going to run. Um, and especially with customer acquisition, the key thing is the customer. So for you as, uh, as a, uh, as a you know, business owner or the person starting the business, make sure you understand the customer, make sure you understand the questions they are asking at each stage, right? Now to help you out with the actual tactical part of it. Uh, so, you know, are you using uh, Twitter or are you using uh, Instagram? What posts are you doing? Who's creating the content? All of that. I think those parts are ripe for, you know, giving to experts to kind of help you handle. But the overall kind of strategy of what you want to do um, and understanding the customer. So because if, if when you go to an expert, 
uh, they're going to say, they're going to, you know, maybe help you understand your customer, maybe help you understand the best way to reach them. But at the end of the day, you will know best because of the work you've already put in, what your customer wants. Um, and so the, my answer is yes and no. Yes, in that you need to do, you do have to take some initiative to understand the customer, to come up with the strategy that you want to use. But as you create a strategy, and especially as you implement the tactics, um, if you do not have the resources, you do not have the time, it's good to use uh, expect companies to help you do that. And I'll tell you from my own experience that creating content is difficult. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult, tedious practice to kind of keep up, engaging content, that is. Uh, but be involved so you understand what is going out, what your customers are getting, what they need. But definitely reach out to people who can help you kind of shape that out uh, initially. Uh, Jim, uh, you may have an opinion on that since you're the other end of, uh, you know, yeah, the person people will come to, the expert people will come to for such help. Yeah, definitely. But thank you. I mean, uh, pretty much what David said, it's really important as a business owner to have a good sense of the direction you want your business to go into. Um, Otherwise, it means that anybody can sway you and that does not bode well for business. So for my clients, what I typically do is uh, when they come to me um, and they might say, oh, I want to take a training, a digital skills training, or I want a strategy, or I just want a consultation, they're not really sure exactly what they want. So as the person who kind of has a sense of which direction most businesses would likely go in, I have tools that I provide to them to get information that will allow me to propose, give them a number of proposals. So I might say, okay, because you are just starting out, typically for businesses that are just starting out online, and it's still pretty much a one man or one woman show, um, what I recommend is you need to have a lot of those skill sets. You have to have some of yeah. those elements, definitely. Um, so first I'll say, let's do a training. After the training, if you still find that you're having a very hard time um, and you can't figure things out and all the trainings that I do involve brainstorming. So I will do some brainstorming for you. So already you have some strategies in there. Um, if you need more of that, then that's when I will say, okay, let's talk about a digital strategy. And I agree with you. I know the struggle and the hustle um, when it comes to small businesses and the question of where do you invest your money. But the principle that I typically use is you want to make your investments in areas that um, will bring you back, right? That will always give you something back. Lost, so, uh, do you mean oh, she's back? Sorry, I don't know, internet, you know, Africa. <laughs> um, so you want to invest in those things that will give you value back over and over and over again. And a strategy helps do that. So if it's a one-off thing, I might say, think about it before you put the money there. But when you get to the point where you have done all you can and you need that expert input, then yes, definitely invest in the strategy. And even if it might seem a little expensive initially, think about the fact that it's going to feed this entire customer acquisition process, which will feed um, the revenue that your business makes and so on. That said, like with Circumspec, we do offer um, discounted amounts for our services to SMEs, small businesses especially, because we know that we know the struggle. So um, I'm happy to talk to you about that, definitely. Uh, I wanted to respond on the question about B2B. So even though you are business to business, don't forget that people make up businesses, people make up companies. So when you're talking about how to engage a business, at the end of the day, the people element is still there. Granted, it will be professional networking. One way that um, Circumspect has done this successfully is through partnerships, collaborations. It doesn't always have to start off with money first. So you can start off with, let's work on something together. You bring different skill sets, um, different strengths, and then that way the company or the, or the organization that you're looking to do work with, you don't have to convince them at that point because they've worked with you and they've seen the kind of skill sets you have and the value that you bring um, service-wise. And then after that, Typically, what will happen is they'll say, oh, actually, so we've been having a struggle with X, Y, Z. Um, would you be willing to like work with us on it? And then you take it from there. So you have to realize that every business has its core areas and its strengths. And what it means is that all those other areas where it does not have the capacity, 
it will either a hire someone in-house to handle that element or it might be outsourced externally to um to another business yeah so i hope that answers those two questions um david back to you thank you um i'm going to just say two more questions and then we'll uh end here we'll try and as much as possible to respond uh, individually to the questions that were asked uh, that we couldn't get to so the first is from Kwesi Mfuni who asks, um, would you advise uh, one stick to one social media platform with high feedback or maintain the various for different uh, scope of reach? Um, uh, Jimmy and I spoke a little bit about that. Maybe I'll have a kind of, kind of give a, 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 an answer to that. Um, and then the last one is on, um, uh, okay, so this, this is Eric. Is the app that can help with social listening? Uh, and uh, so Jamila, that's, I think you brought that up. So if you could speak to, uh, to that. Yeah, so I think you can go first and then Jamila can go. Okay, so, um, sorry, the question again. Uh, so the question for you uh, is from Kwesi uh, and he is asking, uh, would you advise that somebody sticks to one social media platform that seems to be generating a lot of traffic for them mm -hmm. or that they should kind of maintain presence on all the other ones, uh, uh, you know, because they, they set different purposes as it were. Okay. So um, if it's important or if you feel like it's a, a particular social media platform is where your customers are, definitely you should direct efforts into building that as well. But I, I think we all get very excited when um, a new social media platform comes up and we don't really take time to go through some of the, um, the questions that Jamila stated are very important when you are starting a social media account. And that is why are you starting that account? Um, and basically the people who are in that or use that social media um, platform, are they in your target audience? If you want to sell to people who are, you know, probably 30 above, I don't think that you'll find majority of them on TikTok. And creating content for TikTok and finding somebody to manage TikTok, you know, using all that energy that you can actually use to direct that to where people actually are will be a waste, a, a, a huge waste of your time. So I would say that don't, don't let the trends get to you um, still, still maintain that focus on why you're online and, you know, the people who you are trying to serve and what you are presenting to them online. And that will basically um, help you answer whenever a new um, platform comes up, whether it will help you answer whether, okay, is, should I go for this or not? If you're not into short videos, TikTok is not anywhere you need to go to. You know, there are other tools on social media or these other social media platforms that will 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 um, be able to solve that problem for you. So again, time, energy, and money um, goes into creating the content for all these platforms. So you need to be very mindful, especially if you're a, a startup, you don't have enough of that. Why would you want to even like, you know, spread it out and then lose out on like really going in on having one platform that is basically giving you all the sales that you, you probably need. Okay, um, so to answer the question about, I was actually just type, typing it, but I guess um, I can mention it so everybody can hear, um, on social listening. So ones that I have used personally, one is called Keyhole um, and then Sprout Social. But the thing with social listening tools, what I've noticed now is they're very expensive. So you have to actually sign up for a plan in order to use them. So. I do not recommend as a startup, unless of course a big part of the work you do is with regards to like data analytics or requires you to do heavy social lis listening. I would say try and focus on free options more, but these are like dedicated apps for social listening, Sprout Social and um, Keyhole, but expect to pay something basically. Um, there's also a melt meltwater platform that I've used in the past um, for specific clients. So those are three. But for free options, each of the platforms actually has some level of social listening embedded in them. So you know your notifications tab, that's part of social listening. It's letting you know 
what people are saying about you. Another great tool for doing social listening is hashtags. When you come up with brand specific hashtags, it enables you to track conversations that your customers might be having about the brand um, very, very easily. So for instance, with Circumspect, we have the hashtag Thrive With Digital, and we use that during all of our trainings. Um, so that our trainees, even while we are in the trainings, they can share like what they're learning, what is working, any questions they have. And then after the training, we go back and check that to see if there was anything there that um, might, might need um, us to fine tune what we, we offered in that training. Facebook um, has the Facebook mentions. And if you connect your, if you have the Instagram business and you connect it to your Facebook page, what Facebook will do is it will aggregate everything that people are saying or all the comments and likes that you're getting on those two platforms. It will aggregate it into one dash dashboard on your Facebook page. And that gives you a nice view of what is happening with regards to what people are saying about the brand and so on. Another one that is more, is not as like fun or social media, -y, but is really good is Google Alerts. Right. So Google Alerts is a very simple way. You just need to um, come up with a Google Alert for the name of your business or for specific keywords. And I would always recommend that you make sure you fine tune it to your location so that you're not getting things from India when you are here in Accra, Ghana or in Kigali, Rwanda. You need something that's more local. So those are some um, social listening tools that you can use. Um, some require you to actually put in a lot of effort, either by, by way of coming up with a hashtag or by way of like, you need to dish out some money once in a while. Yeah, so I hope that helps answer your questions. All right, um, we want to be mindful of time here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jamila and Athena. I think those have been quite um, uh, instructful. I actually learned quite a bit in terms of the different tools. Um, and what we're going to do is try, uh, somebody was asking for some of the uh, tools we've mentioned um, and maybe even the deck. Uh, we'll make sure that those of you who signed up beforehand, uh, we have your email, so we'll be able to get that uh, information to you. If we're not able to answer your questions, uh, apologies. We'll, uh, we'll definitely uh, uh, take it offline as well and get it to you. Uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, Gordon, I'll hand over to you now. Uh, thank you very much, David, Akpene, and Jamila. This is, again, like David, you're saying, this has been very educational. It doesn't matter how much you know about online uh, digital marketing and uh, customer acquisition, you always learn something new, and I've, been, I've learned a lot. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you to our listeners. I want to remind you to check out africabusinessheroes.org. You know entrepreneurs that can... Uh, be a part of this program and make a difference on the continent. Uh, from Ashesi as an education partner to the Africa Net Prize Initiative, we're very excited to continue to uh, encourage entrepreneurs to acquire these tools that we got here on this webinar and also apply for the program for the prize. Uh, so just uh, keep uh, encouraging people that you know that can make an impact to apply. And also be on the lookout for additional webinars in the series. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you again next time. Thank you to Thank our, you. our panelists as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.